Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Mary, the Book World Editor at the Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. First, a word of thanks to the co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and the other generous sponsors who've made this event possible. If you'd like to add your financial support, please note the information in your program. We'll have some time after the presentation for questions, and I've been asked to remind you that if you come to the microphone, you will be included in the videotape of this event, which may be broadcast at a later date. Our guest this afternoon is Christopher Paul Curtis. And woo, yes, indeed, lots of fans. A native of Flint, Michigan, Christopher began his writing career as a way to pass the time when he was working on an assembly line at a General Motors facility after high school. He followed up his first book, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963, with Bud, Not Buddy, an instant classic, an instant classic about a boy, also from Flint, who hits the road in search of his father. It won the Newbery Medal and the Coretta Scott King Award. His most recent book is The Journey of Little Charlie, a moving novel about an overgrown 12-year-old who finds himself at a moral crossroads shortly after his father's death. It's my extreme pleasure to welcome Christopher Paul Curtis to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here at the National Book Festival. I was at the first one, and now, 18 years later, it's great to be back. Um, last night was a wonderful evening. Uh, I got to hear a hero of mine speak, Jacqueline Woodson. <laughs> And uh, Jackie has always been very special to me. And 2018 has been a great year for Jackie. She was named the Ambassador for Children's Literature. She also won the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award uh, for Lifetime Achievement. Now, the Astrid Lindgren Memorial part is cool, but the award part is unbelievable. The amount of money that she won with that was just mind-boggling, and, and nobody deserved it more than Jacqueline. I'm so proud to, uh, to know her. She wrote a blurb for uh, The Watsons Go to Birmingham. She was one of the first people to read it, uh, and she was involved in one of the first appearances I did. I was going to, uh, soon after The Watsons Go to Birmingham was published, uh, publishers called me and said, would you like to go to California to speak in San Diego? And I said, of course. So I flew out to San Diego. Um, I, I didn't understand how things worked. I was broke. I had like $40, and I was going to be in San Diego for four days. So I was trying to figure out how I was going to uh, ration this to buy my meals. We were driving in from the airport, uh, and the cab driver said, this is the hotel. It was on one side of the expressway. On the other side of the expressway was a Denny's. And this was back when Denny's had the $1.99, are you out of your mind? Promo going on. And I thought, hallelujah, Denny's. So I go in, uh, in this beautiful room. I'm in there, but I'm hungry, so I decide to go to Denny's. I walk out. There's about a two-mile run of expressway this way, a two-mile run of expressway that way. So I decide I'm going to cross the expressway. And if any of you have ever seen the movie Bowfinger, I'm pretty sure that was based on me, where Eddie Murphy's trying to run across the expressway. So anyway, I ran across eastbound, I ran across westbound, I got to Denny's, I had my 199 meal, I ran across westbound, I ran across eastbound, came back, and then I had the chance to meet Jackie. And we talked for a while, and I said to her, how do you, you travel a lot, don't you? And she told me she does. And I said, how do you afford this? And she said, what do you mean? I said, it, doesn't it get expensive eating out all the time? And then she said, Jacqueline Woodson has said two things to me that are just emblazoned in my mind that I'll remember forever. And she said, no, 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 the publisher pays for everything. And in the words she says that I'll remember forever are, they don't even care if you eat the peanuts out of the minibar. So uh, I, I was very grateful to Jackie. I said, you know what, Jackie, is there anything I can do for you, anything? And the second thing that Jackie said to me was, and this is emblazoned word for word too, she said, look, why don't we make a pact? Let's say that you win some great award with a lot of money attached to it, or I win some great award with a lot of money attached to it. Let's agree to divide it 50-50. <laughs> Jackie was notified of the award in March 
by the time May came around, I was wondering why I wasn't getting any calls or emails or anything. So if any of you know Jackie, please let her know that I'm waiting. I, it's a real pleasure to be here in many ways. One of the reasons I am the father of a seven-year-old girl, a six-year-old girl, and a four-year-old boy, and the noise they make is unbelievable. And it was nice to be, to be in a room last night and not to you know, wake up every second with a child in your face. Uh, my seven-year-old, first, are there any Somalis in the audience? Anybody speak Somali? Great. My uh, seven-year-old's name is Ayan. My six-year-old's name is Abion. My four-year-old's name is Liban. And in the Somali tradition, names are very important. It's uh, something that the child's going to have for the rest of their life. So it's got to be something that's very important. So I did a lot of research on the names. And the name Ayan, I discovered, means, and I get this confused, daughter of the handsomest, kindest, most intelligent, most charming man in the clan. Abion means another daughter of the handsomest, kindest. And Liban, who we call our little surprise, is a prayer. And the prayer is, oh God, let this be the last child of the handsomest, kindest, most loving man in the clan. Uh, yeah, a lot of times I'm asked, how did you become an author? But that's one of those questions that there's so many variables that come into it that it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it was. Uh, for 13 years after high school, I worked in Fisher Body Plant in Flint, Michigan, putting doors on Buicks. I hated this job. And after 13 years, I got the courage to quit. It was a scary thing. I was thrown to, into uh, the world of menial jobs. I worked as a garbage man. I worked as a maintenance man in an apartment complex. Um, I hit bottom when I was actually the co-campaign chairman for a United States senator for a year. Uh, but I finally moved to Windsor, Ontario, and uh, got a job just outside of Detroit at a, at a check writing place. And I was the lowest paid person in the place. I was making $7 an hour. Uh, this was through manpower. And I found out they were paying manpower $17 an hour, and I was getting $7 of it. It doesn't make you want to be a happy employee. But I was happy to have the job, and I was eventually hired full time. So I got a raise to $7.50. Uh, an opening came up in consumer, uh, customer service representative, so I applied for it, and I knew the two women who ran the cust uh, customer service representatives, so I figured this was kind of pretty much a slam dunk. I came to work that day of the interview, I had my work clothes on, I did half a day of work, I put my suit on, I brought a suit, I walked in, and as soon as I walked into the room, the women laughed, and I thought, oh, this is not a good reaction. And they said, oh, you didn't have to wear a suit. And I thought, no, I, I'm very serious about this. I want to, uh, this to happen. And so we talked for a while. And about a week later, the human resources uh, woman called. And I went into her office. And you can tell right away. I mean, the air just wasn't right. And so she said, you did a great job at the interview. There are two or three things like that. And then there was, I was waiting for the but. And then the but came. And the but was, she said, but we don't think you're ready to speak to the public yet. I was crushed. I was absolutely crushed. So I started looking for other places to work. Uh, something came up where I was able to take a year off work, and uh, then I'd get my job back when I came back after a year. So I said to myself, I'm going to take this year, and I'm going to take it very seriously. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go look for another job. But uh, what, the main thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to follow a dream that I have. I'm going to try to write a book. So every day I'd get up, and when the library opened, I'd be right there. I'd go in. I'd start writing. I was my own boss. I had to give myself the same respect I gave my other bosses. Every day I went and did it, ended up with a manuscript that was 250 pages long. Next step was to try to get it published. I sent it to Little Brown. It was rejected. I sent it to Random House, uh, Wendy Lamb Books. Uh, it was rejected, but then she called and said that they wanted to publish it anyway. This was a cause for such celebration in my house. You know what we did? No, we didn't party. We went to Red Lobster for dinner. Because <laughs> I knew once you publish a book, you're not a millionaire, but you're filthy rich. Um, the book came out, did very well. Then uh, the, what's the kind of ironic thing is when I was at, back at work, 
I got a call from a principal of an elementary school uh, in Garden City, Michigan, and he said, we've heard that you've written a book and we'd like you to come and speak to our school. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And he said, we don't have much money to give you. We can only give you $300. I was making $280 a week for 40 hours at the, uh, uh, at the, the check writing place. I said, well, okay, this one time I'll do it for $300. <laughs> So I did it for $300. The word got out. I, I, just, I love talking to young people. The word got out. Um, and after a while, I was able to quit the job, not because of royalties from the book, but because I was getting enough money from speaking engagements. So it was kind of ironic that I was able to finally leave the place where they didn't think I could speak to the public by speaking to the public. Thank you. I felt the same way. I applauded a long time. <laughs> um, my, the, the, books that I'd like, the book I'd like to talk about now is uh, The Journey of Little Charlie. This, of course, everybody knows is Michigan. This is Michigan. And I'm from a city right here called Flint. Right here is Detroit. About 40 miles inside of Canada over here is a little settlement called Buxton, Ontario. And Buxton was uh, started by a Presbyterian minister, I believe he was from Kentucky, whose wife inherited slaves. He felt it was immoral, so he allowed the slaves to work uh, on the farms around there and keep their wages. He still thought that was immoral, so he bought this land in Canada. It was three miles by six miles, and he used it as a settlement for people who have escaped from slavery. Uh, the cool thing was this became very well known throughout the United States, and this is where a lot of the people from the Underground Railroad uh, ended up. I'd always wanted to write a book about slavery, but I, I write first person, and it's difficult for me. I like to put myself into the mind of the character that I'm writing about, and it's difficult for me to imagine what it would be like to be a slave. I had... I, I don't think any of you could imagine it, and I knew I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have to think of yourself as an animal. And the worst thing I thought is that you'd have to think of your children. You'd have to teach your children that they are animals if you wanted them to live, uh, if you wanted them to uh, survive as a slave. So uh, I, I knew I couldn't write a story from first, uh, first person story from the uh, viewpoint of somebody who would even escape slavery, because we understand so much about post traumatic stress. There, there must have been post-traumatic, uh, severe post-traumatic stress. So I thought, okay, if I write about Buxton, I can write about the first child who was born free there. Uh, so I, I wrote uh, Elijah of Buxton. Um, I'm asked a lot of times by young people, what is your favorite book? And at author school, when you go to author school, they teach you a standard answer to a lot of questions. That's not real. There's no such thing as author school. They teach you standard answers. Uh, and the answer to that is you're supposed to look very serious and say, when a child says, what is your favorite book? You're supposed to say, oh, my books are like my children. I don't have favorites. I have favorite books, and I have favorite children. <laughs> and since this is being recorded, my children will see this. Ayan is my favorite seven-year-old. Abion is my favorite six-year-old. Liban is my favorite four-year-old. <laughs> so I, I wrote the story from the point of view of Elijah, and uh, I was able to do a lot of research on Buxton, and there were just so many beautiful stories that came out of Buxton. One of them was the story of a girl from New Orleans, a slave girl, who had been brought by her uh, enslaver's family to Detroit as, as a servant. She was, she was a toy, really, for the uh, slave family's child. Uh, black children were done, used like this often. They were to be a companion and a toy. So she was a toy for this girl. She went to, she was about 10 years old. She went to Detroit. She came back home. Uh, her mother asked her how things were, what happened. And she told her mother, I was in Detroit. And did you know that I looked right across a river and on the other side of the river was Canada? And the, this was in the, er, the records in Buxton. The mother slapped the girl. And the girl grabbed her face and said, why? Why did you slap me? And the mother said, 
you saw Canada and you didn't do anything that you could to try to get to it. And the little girl said, but mommy, I'd never see you again. And she slapped her again and she said, do you know what's waiting for you here? Do you know I know what's waiting for you here? If that happens again, you go do whatever you can and you get across that river. They took her again, she escaped. She was one of the uh, people who grew up in Buxton. Uh, the Journey of Little Charlie, which is the third of the books, is the story of a boy named, uh, he was originally called Chucky Bobo. But see that, and the name was changed. I, and you, writing to the young people, my relationship with my editors is a lot like your relationship with an English teacher. They know things that you don't know. And if you're smart, you listen to them. Uh, I listen to what my editors have to say. And they didn't like the name Chucky Bobo because they said, when you say Chucky, everybody thinks of the little murderous doll. And so I, I thought about it and you know, you write the whole story and then I, I, it was hard, but I said, okay, I agree. So we called the book Little Charlie, The Journey of Little Charlie. And Little Charlie is a six foot four, 12 year old boy who is shanghaied into going north uh, from Possum Moan, South Carolina. He goes north to Detroit to try to retrieve a family that had run away years before. They finally were found, and uh, the, the slave catcher took Charlie with him uh, to find them. It, the story goes into Canada. It touches on Buxton again, and it's called uh, part, one of the part of the Buxton Chronicles. Um, I, it, it's funny, as an author, the, way you, the relationship you have with a book, because I didn't particularly think it was a strong book, even after we'd worked on it for a long time. And, uh, but it's been the best reviewed book that I've done, that I've written, and, and I'm happy for that. But uh, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if I can judge, if I'm a bad judge of my own books. Um, my career as a writer has, a lot of great things have happened to me. One of the coolest things is uh, several years ago, I got a call to come to New York City uh, because somebody wanted to make a movie out of the Watsons who go to Birmingham. So I go to, to New York City and I met Whoopi Goldberg and she bought the rights to make a movie. And that wasn't the cool thing. The cool thing was Whoopi brought a doll for my daughter and it's a Whoopi doll. And I think Whoopi had some bad ones she was trying to get rid of because mine looks like it's got a sore neck and its head is hanging like this and its dreads are hanging down like that and it's holding something called high chew. And Hai Chu was a candy from uh, Japan that the people weren't eating right. They were chewing it and spitting it out like gum. They wanted them to chew it and swallow it. So their solution was to make this doll. So I'm sitting at this table and Whoopi, there's Whoopi there, her five assistants are. One of them reaches in the bag, puts the doll on the table, and Whoopi claps her hands twice and the doll starts to walk. And it walks like Frankenstein with a sore neck. But it also starts to talk and it says over and over, chew, chew, swallow. Chew, chew, swallow. I brought the doll home. The doll is still under my bed in a bag. No one will ever see that doll. Anyway, we have time for a few questions. If anybody has any questions they'd like to ask. Um, hello. Uh, hello. In your book, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, what was your inspiration for the pet hospital? Ah, the uh, world-famous Watson Pet Hospital. As a writer, are you a writer? Okay, you're a writer. As a writer, we have a real advantage over the readers in that we can take things that happen to us, we can take things that happen to other people, we can take our own imagination and use it to uh, make the story interesting and to make the story work. Uh, the pet hospital was something that happened to me. I noticed that this was back in the days before dogs had diseases. I don't know, all of a sudden dogs now are getting every disease you can think of. Back then, you got hit by a car, you know, and that was it. And I noticed that if a dog got sick or was hit by a car or something, it always would run behind the couch. And uh, you, you'd come back the next day and the dog was either gone or the dog was sitting back there, you know, getting better. And I, in my mind, I said, well, this must be like a pet hospital. 
So that is something that really happened to me. I thought that the dogs went behind the couch and were either healed or went to doggy heaven. Um, what's your favorite part about writing books? What's my favorite part about writing books? I love just about everything about writing books. Uh, but the only thing I don't like is getting my first editorial letter from my editor because I know how they do it. The first three pages, like you get a 25 page letter and the first three pages are how wonderful this book is. And, oh, it's a great book. And then the last 22 pages are change this, do this differently. We don't like this, blah, 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 blah. So I, when I get a letter like that, um, I, I won't open the email for a week or so before I finally say, okay, let's do it. That's my least favorite part. My favorite part, I think, and, and this has changed over the years, is the fact that I'm able to give something to today's students that I didn't have. When I was younger, there were no books for, by, or about African-American kids. And I have teachers come up to me all the time now and say, you know, thank you for writing the book. And I, I think teachers are, even though they're overpaid and underworked, <laughs> I think teachers are some of the, the greatest people in our society. And the fact that, <laughs> the fact that I can do anything that can make a teacher's job easier, I think is great. Yeah. All right, hello? Hello. Oh. Um, I just want to say, um, my group read the book, But Not Buddy, and we really liked it. Okay. And, and we were wondering if you can make a second book. About Bud? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you finish a book, one of the things that happens is the characters are gone. And it, it's almost like they die, because you don't, when I write the book, I go every day, I talk to Bud, I talk to his friends, and Bud is gone. Uh, there's a little bit about Bud, and I don't know if you've read The Mighty Miss Malone. There's a little bit of Bud in there. But as far as to write a, uh, a sequel to Bud, I, I think I'd have to be really desperate to write a sequel. So if you see a sequel, if you see Bud Not Buddy 2, you can say, I know that author. He's desperate. <laughs> if you want to make a second Bud Not Buddy, what would it be about? <laughs> <laughs> if I were to write a second Bud Not Buddy, what would it be about? Uh, I don't know. I, um, I, I think that Bud became a great saxophone player, that uh, he found happiness in life. Nah, that wouldn't be a good book. <laughs> yes. Okay, so my friend's named the Whirlpool. The Whirlpool. The Whirlpool? Yeah. <laughs> and how do you make that character? How? How do you make the whirlpool? The whirlpool. The questions about the whirlpool. That's the thing I get more, most questions about. Uh, Grandma Sands warns the boys not to go down to the water. They'll get caught up. She's got a southern accent. You'll get caught up in the whirlpool. And Kenny didn't understand what she said, so he asked Byron, the 13-year-old juvenile delinquent, and he said to Byron, what did she say? And he said, you'll get caught by the whirlpool. And he said, what's the whirlpool? And Byron told him, the wool poo is Winnie the Pooh's evil twin brother <laughs> that nobody writes about because he sits in the water and pulls kids down and drowns them. So uh, that's where that came from. Yes? How did you come up with the inspiration for Dolly Peaches from the Mighty Miss Malone? The, the inspiration for? Dolly Peaches. Dolly Peaches? Yeah. Every author's nightmare. <laughs> I refresh my memory. I'm going to see if you know about Dolly. Tell me a little bit about Dolly Peaches. He bullies Jimmy. He bullies? Jimmy. Does his oh, brother. oh, oh. It's just a, a, a bully. I, and I can't remember. There was some, some reason I chose that name. I can't remember why, though. Thank you. Thank you. You did a very good job. I'm glad you were paying attention. <laughs> How many months does it take to release a book? Wow. How old are you? Seven. Seven. I have a seven-year-old. She wouldn't have asked me that. <laughs> she would have asked me something like, uh, what's your favorite unicorn's name? But uh, 
How many months does it take to release the book? That's a loaded question. It can take years, it, a minimum probably of two years from the time I finish it, from the time I start it to the time it comes out, probably two to three years because it goes through the publishing process and that's very involved. The publisher's name's on there. They don't want to get embarrassed. My name's on there. I don't want to get embarrassed. So everybody's very careful what they write. Very good question. Um, uh, is there any pattern to when in Watson's go to Birmingham, um, when Byron is being like a nice friend to Kenny and when he's playing tricks and getting in trouble? Like it's, he it's, seems like a bad guy right. and then he's super nice. And I know this problems. question. Is there any pattern to why does Byron change so suddenly? The, the book is narrated by Kenny. We're getting Kenny's point of view. Uh, do you have an older brother or sister? If you did, you think they were the worst person in the world. Uh, and that's what Kenny thought about Byron. He thought he was the worst person in the world. But if you read between the lines, you can see Byron's not as bad a person as Kenny thought. And uh, Kenny really started to see what Byron was really like. Byron's really kind of a, a, a sensitive, nice guy underneath all the bravado. Good question. Yes? Hi. Um, I Hi. I used to teach. What grade are you in? <laughs> <laughs> Twelve points. <laughs> um, 12 point something. Anyway, I used to teach and I taught sixth grade for a long time. So I always, I missed you when you came the first time, like 18 years ago. Um, but I wanted to basically tell you that um, any chance I got, I taught English language arts and sometimes I taught geography. No matter which subject I taught, I always had them read that book. And I have my copy still that's underlying quite, you know, <laughs> just all throughout. But anyway, but basically I just want to let you know that Every time um, we got to the whirlpool and we got to the vomit, I cried oh. every single time. <laughs> so I just wanted to let you know that it always had that effect on me. I, I came across you as an author just by accident, but that is like one of my absolute favorite books. Um, I was not somebody who grew up reading um, books for children. I, I started reading them as an adult. And mm -hmm. so I just absolutely love them. I love everything that you've written. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm getting the wrap it up sign, so I'd like to say thank you to all of you for supporting me through the years, and keep reading and support your teachers and your librarians. Thank you very much.